In this video, I'm going to cover the properties of solids. So the way uh, that atoms are arranged in a solid um, can be discovered uh, by using X-ray diffraction. So in X-ray diffraction, the way that this works is that we have um, an X-ray tube source, some, um, some way to generate X-rays. X-rays are emitted from the source in all directions. Um, so radiation generally radiates in all directions. Um, so if we want to be able to, to create a beam of X-rays, we have to put it through some kind of lead screen or something with a hole so it blocks most of that radiation but only a small beam can come through. So the beam of X-rays comes through and hits whatever solid it is we're looking at Generally, um, in order to, to get information about the repeating pattern of atoms in a solid, then this solid here needs to be crystalline, which means that there are uh, different ways that solid materials can come. They can come as a crystal, um, where the atoms are, are in patterns that are well-defined and repeated over long distances, or they can come as amorphous, uh, which is um, where there is m patterns, potentially short-term patterns in the structure, but not a lot of repeating long-term patterns. They don't go for very long in an amorphous structure. So then when a source of x-rays is di directed at a material with a well-arranged pattern of atoms, then what happens is those x-rays kind of bounce off the atoms within the sample and uh, are come out of the sample we call those diffracted x-rays and those diffracted x-rays hit a screen where we can pick up the individual uh, photons so it kind of makes a pattern on this screen the x-ray detector that two-dimensionally looks a little something like this and then there's a lot of math involved but this two-dimensional pattern on the x-ray detector uh, it gets translated into a three-dimensional arrangement of atoms that must have given rise to this pattern. It's kind of like you could deduce what a house looks like by just um, examining the shadow of the house at different times of day, right? Without actually being able to look at the 3D structure, if you saw how the shadow moved as the source of light moved, then you could get information about the three-dimensional structure of the house. That's kind of what's happening here. We kind of get a shadow of the structure, a two-dimensional image of the structure that um, through mathematical analysis can be converted into a three-dimensional uh, three structure for that solid. So this is um, an example of what happens when x-rays come into uh, sam an, a solid sample. So if we have um, the path that when the x-ray comes in, generally we have two different rays coming in. So And those rays will be separated by um, some known distance. And so if we know what the distance between those paths are, and then we can see the angle at which they are coming in and the angle at which they are diffracted from the sample, then we can deduce what the um, the distance between these atomic layers is, this D, and that helps us to deduce what the pattern of the atoms is. So this is one way where we can um, you use the information from the two-dimensional X-ray diffraction um, and use these, some of these values to be able to uh, calculate what the three-dimensional structure of a sample is going to look like. So um, again, in order to, to get good x-ray data, we generally have to have a solid that has a very well-defined repeating structure. And so we call those kinds of samples crystalline, when most of the atoms in the sample are appear in a pattern that repeats over the entire sample. So the reason that um, sodium chloride crystals are cubic is because the sodium chloride atoms themselves are cubic if you go down to the smallest level and we look at the, the unit cell or the smallest repeating pattern of sodium chloride, the atoms are actually arranged in a cubic pattern. And when we have 
billions and billions of atoms arranged in a cubic pattern and we get a sample that's large enough for us to see with our eyes, then that sample is also cubic. It actually looks like a little cube. And perhaps you've seen uh, quartz crystals, which are generally hexagonal. And so the reason that a quartz crystal is hexagonal, which is silicon dioxide, and a sodium chloride crystal is cubic, is because of the arrangement of the atoms at the smallest scale. If, those, if the, if the re smallest repeating pattern in a solid structure um, is repeated again and again and again and again, we call that a crystal, and we know that it's a crystal because we can actually see the structure um, macroscopically. So quartz crystals look like hexagonal crystals, and sodium chloride crystals look like cubic crystals. So um, the smallest unit that shows the pattern of arrangement for all of the particles is called the unit cell. And in a crystalline structure, that unit cell is repeated over and over and over and over again, and they are all identical to each other. So in a sample that's amorphous, that's not crystalline, then that unit cell is different in different sections, and the different sections might be oriented in different uh, directions. So amorphous structures do have unit cells but the unit cells don't necessarily repeat throughout the entire structure um, so the pattern is not as regular um, it's not as predictable and it doesn't generally give us structures macroscopically that give us information about the nanoscopic arrangement of the atoms because none of those nanoscopic patterns are repeated So here's an example of a unit cell um, from a simple cubic solid. So unit cells are three-dimensional and they usually contain two or three layers of atoms. So um, the remember these atoms are going to get as close together as possible in a solid and um, when we're talking about the unit cell it's always more than just one layer. It's, it's two or three layers. Uh, and unit cells are repeated over and over to give macroscopic crystal structures of the solid. So if we look anywhere in the solid at any point in one of these hexagonal quartz crystals, every single unit cell that we examine will look exactly the same as all of the other unit cells. They're all identical. Uh, each particle in the unit cell is called a lattice point. And lattice planes are planes connecting equivalent points in unit cells throughout the lattice. So, for example, we can see here, this is a lattice plane. Each particle, here's a particle, this is a lattice point, this is a lattice point, this is a lattice point, and this is a lattice point. So the lattice plane would be the top of this cube right here. Here are some examples of unit cells, and these aren't anything that you're gonna have to remember, so I'm just giving you some different examples of what unit cells might look like. So a cubic unit cell has all of the sides are equal and all of the angles are 90 degrees. So we get a perfect cube. We have a unit cell where the sides A and C are equal, this and this are equal, but B is longer, but still all of the angles are 90 degrees. We call that tetragonal. And this one, A and B and C are all different lengths, but they're still 90 degrees. So using just these uh, two descriptions, we can describe all seven different unit cells. All we have to do is describe what are the lengths of A, B, and C, and what are the angles that uh, are inside. So if, if none of the lengths are the same, but all the angles are 90, we call that orthorhombic. If none of the lengths are the same and none of the angles are 90, we call that triclinic. So this is the kind of information that we get from an X-ray diffraction analysis. We can see what these different, uh, we see the arrangement of atoms, we see where the atoms are because they bounce off, the x-rays bounce off those atoms and create specific patterns. And that gives us information about the lengths uh, between the atoms and the angles in a unit cell. So then we can say definitively that once we um, have a x-ray diffraction analysis of a solid, then we can uh, characterize it as one of these seven unit cells. The number of other particles each particle is in contact with is called its coordination number.
for ions, it is the number of oppositely charged ions an ion is in contact with. So um, either ions or um, atoms if we're talking about a covalent molecule, or excuse me, a covalent solid. Higher coordination number means more interaction, therefore stronger attractive forces hold the crystal together. So we'll see that um, substances that have crystal structures that have a higher coordination number generally have a higher melting point because the higher coordination number means that there are more intermolecular forces between those atoms that are in contact with each other and we have to add more energy to break those forces apart in order to melt the solid. Uh, the packing efficiency is the percentage of volume in the unit cell occupied by particles. So we'll see that um, although the particles do try to get as close to each other as possible, there are still spaces within a crystal structure given that each atom is spherical. There are still, there's still wasted space because if you try to pack spheres together as close as possible, they can't, they don't touch at the corners. So there are usually gaps inside of a crystal structure and the packing efficiency is a way that we can measure how many of those gaps and how big they are. So um, the higher the packing efficiency, the smaller the number of gaps, the smaller the spaces in between each atom. They're packed very close together. They have a high packing efficiency. Cubic unit cells are all 90 degree angles between corners of the unit cell and the length of all the edges are equal. So we're going to kind of look at some of these cubic unit cells in particular, even though there are lots of other unit cells, um, but we're going to kind of focus on these in this chapter. So if the unit cell is made of spherical particles, then one eighth of each corner particle is within the cube, one half of each particle is on a face, and one quarter of each particle is on an edge. Now what does that mean? Let's look at some simple cubic structures here. So in a cubic unit cell, um, we have uh, the distance between atoms. Here's an atom and here's an atom. The distance between these lattice points is equal to the distance between these lattice points, which is equal to the distance between these lattice points. So A equals B equals C. And all of these angles are 90 degrees. So this is a cubic unit cell. This is also a cubic unit cell because the distance between here and here is equal to the distance between here and here, which is equal to the distance between here and here, and all the angles are 90. That's also true down here. The distance between this purple one and this purple one is equal to the distance and so on and so on. So all of these meet that criteria in this, uh, all of these meet this criteria here for being a cubic unit cell. A equals B equals C and they're all 90 degrees. So. Um, depending on what the uh, atoms are, the specific um, element that we're talking about here, there are different ways in which the atoms can pack together. So some atoms pack together in what we call a simple cubic unit cell. And in a simple cubic unit cell, there are um, eight atoms that we can see right here, eight atoms, right? And um, there are one atom at each corner of a cube, and there are no atoms in the middle. So a simple cubic has one atom at each corner with nothing in the middle. So the coordination number is six, and what that means is that every atom in this, uh, in a simple cubic arrangement will be next to six other atoms. And so it's kind of hard to see from this representation, but we'll look at that in more detail here in a minute. The edge length in terms of R is 2R, and what that means is R is the radius of the atom itself. So if we know what atom we're talking about, nickel, for example, then I, the, the radius of a nickel atom is well defined. And if I know what the radius of the nickel atom is, then I know that this, for example, is one radius from the center to the edge, that's one radius, and then from the edge to the center. So this, the length right here of this unit cell from, center, from the center of the atom to the center of another atom is just two times the radius. And the packing efficiency in a simple cubic is 52%, which is pretty low, which means that of all the space, all of the volume that's available within this, uh, within this cube of given length, given edge length, 
of all of that space, 52% is full of matter and 48% is empty space. So that's not a particularly high packing efficiency. There's a lot of empty space in a simple cubic and you can see that. This empty gap right here in the middle, that's a lot of space. Well look, the body centered cubic kind of takes care of that. The body centered cubic sticks an atom right in the middle. So that atom is the same, even though it's yellow, it's the same element. So all of these atoms are the same size atom in the unit cells that we're looking at now. They're made yellow or purple so that we can see the difference between atoms that are at the corners. All the purple ones are at a corner and atoms that are in the middle, in this case, the one in the middle is yellow and the ones that are at the corners are purple, but they're all the same size atom. They all have the same radius. So um, atoms per unit cell, like this one, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Why does it say that there's only one atom per unit cell if I have eight atoms here? This is eight plus one, so nine atoms, but it says that I have two. And this is, we'll get to this one in a minute. So the reason that these are don't line up is because what is pictured here is complete atoms, but the unit cell does not encompass the entire volume of all of these, uh, of all of, of this structure that's represented. The unit cell only goes from the center of each atom. So it goes from here to here to here to here, and then to the ones in the back. So that means at least half of these atoms are getting sliced off as I go from center to center to center to center. And I'm not counting those atoms when I'm saying how many atoms on average are there per unit cell. So we'll look at that in more detail in a minute. The coordination number for each atom in a body-centered cubic, body-centered because there's one atom right in the middle of the body, the coordination number means each atom is next to eight other atoms. Here, each atom is next to six. Here, each atom is next to eight. There is a bit of geometry involved to see this one, but we can determine the length from here to here as being 4r divided by the square root of 3. So I can't say that this is 1r, 1r, right? It's not, this is not. Uh, 2 times r because there's some distance in between these atoms that is unaccounted for. So in order to determine uh, the radius from the unit uh, from the edge length of a unit cell or vice versa, the edge length of a unit cell from the radius of an atom, if I know what atom I'm talking about, here I have to use atoms that are all touching. These two atoms aren't touching. So in order to find the edge length of the radius here, I have to put a point between this one here, and the one down here in the corner, and it also passes through the yellow one. So see the yellow one and the purple one, this one is touching this one, and this one is touching this one. Oops. So if I draw a line from here to here, then I have 4R, right? 1R, 2R through the yellow, 3R through the yellow, 4R up to this purple. And then because of the nature of the, this being a triangle and the angles that are involved, um, to determine the length here, I'm not trying to get the diagonal, I want to know what the length of this is, I have to divide that by square root of 3. Packing efficiency in this type of solid is 68%, so more efficient than this. That atom in the middle takes up a lot of space, a lot of that empty space. So now 68% of this volume is matter, and 32% is open empty space. Finally, in the face-centered cubic, I have, there's not, there's no longer an atom in the middle, but now I have an atom at each of the faces. So imagine if I'm looking at this cube here, here I have an atom at each corner, here I have an atom at each corner and one in the middle of the cube, here I have an atom at each corner and an atom at each face. So there's not just one in the middle, there's one on this face and one on this face, so there's one atom in between all four. Here there was only one atom that these four and these four shared. Now there's one gold atom on average for every four uh, uh, corner atoms. What that means is that every atom in a face-centered cubic is next to 12 other atoms. The edge here, again, there's more geometry, but we can determine that this edge here is 2r, or excuse me, 2 times the square root of 2r. 
and the packing efficiency here is even greater we filled up even more of that empty space with matter and now uh, the packing efficiency is 74 percent matter and 26 percent empty space when we pack the atoms like this okay so let's dive into this a little bit more what does it mean that there's only one atom per unit cell well look this is the representation we were just looking at eight atoms one atom at each corner of a cube in a simple cubic in this simple cubic that the unit cell is not represented by the volume that all of these atoms takes up the unit cell is actually represented by this the center of each atom the lattice point of each atom so this square in the middle of these eight atoms kind of superimposed on the center of these eight atoms this is actually the unit cell and this repeats again and again and again because we're looking at the lattice points themselves we're not we don't take the entire atom as our point of reference we're only looking at the point right in the center of each atom and so we're creating a, a geometric structure like this what that does is it only we're leaving out lots of the atom look at this most of this atom is getting sliced off and I only have I'm only including the bit of that atom that's contained in this box which it turns out is only one eighth and how do we know that that's true so if we just focus on any one atom for a minute let's look at in this and we're just looking at this one atom but all of these atoms are exactly the same because they're all in this repeating structure of simple cubic unit cells so we just have atoms one atom at each corner of a cube so if I focus on one atom for a minute I can see that this atom is right is uh, part of this unit cell that I'm focusing on here right this blue this blue cube is kind of the blown up version of this cube inside of these eight atoms so if I focus on this one atom right here in the, in the middle it is part that atom is part of this blue space so part of this atom is inside this blue space so this atom is involved in this unit cell but how much of it is inside the unit cell well this atom oops, this atom right here is a part of this unit cell one and it's also this atom is also involved in this unit cell right here that's next to this blue one right so I've got this one here let me actually write them on top it's gonna make more sense so one it's involved in this one it's also this atom is also has the same slice in this one right it's also part of this atom part of its volume is included in this unit cell so I'll call this two part of this atom is included in this unit cell this unit cell we'll call three part of this atom in the middle is in this unit cell this unit cell we'll call four and then we've got the same thing happening down here I've got this one that's underneath the blue one that's five this cell I've got the one in front of that one so this cell right here in front of that that one is six I've got this cell that's right to the left of six this one right here seven and then the one right behind seven this one right here this is eight so this picture right here is showing me eight unit cells the blue space that's this zoomed up so I, I take this blue spot and now I focus on it to show this so the cube that I'm seeing right here is is copied eight times one two three four five six seven eight so that means that this atom is part of eight unit cells it gets chopped up evenly eight times so if this atom gets chopped up evenly and it's part of eight unit cells this atom gets chopped up evenly and it's part of eight unit cells this atom gets chopped up evenly and it's part of eight unit cells and so on and so on every atom in a simple cubic structure is part of eight unit cells every atom in a simple cubic structure is part of eight unit cells so if that's true then that means that each atom only one eighth of each atom is actually in each unit cell so we can see that here this little corner right here is actually only one eighth of an atom 
So there are eight atoms represented here, but only one eighth of each. So one eighth, two eighth, three eighth, four eighth, five eighths, six eighths, seven eighths, eight eighths are inside of this cube. So that's one. One eighth of an atom at each of eight corners equals one atom per unit cell. So this is how we get to the definition of how many atoms are in a unit cell. Well, this whole atom is not part of one unit cell. This atom is part of eight unit cells. And this atom is part of eight unit cells. So when we use that information, we can see, oh, well, there's only one eighth of each atom in a unit cell. So one eighth times eight equals one, one atom per unit cell. So let's look at body-centered cubic. Here's a body-centered cubic. This is the same example that we were just looking at, the simple cubic. Except now I've got one purple atom at each of eight corners and also a gold atom right in the middle. And it's the same, remember, it's the same element. I'm just showing that this one's in the middle of each unit cell. So, I, so what I have is the simple cubic that I had before the eight unit cells of the simple cubic that I pictured before, but now I'm putting one gold atom in the center of each of those unit cells. So I've, what I've done is I took all those atoms that were already there and I added one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one atom in each unit cell. So now if I focus on this blue section and I zoom in over here, I'm going to do the same thing, slice these off at the lattice points right at the corners. And what that does is I still have one eighth of each atom of each purple one is in the unit cell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight eighths, that's one. But now what's also part of the unit cell is that yellow one that sits in the center. It sits right in the middle of a unit cell. So it's inside of that box. It doesn't get chopped up at all. So the purple ones are not completely inside the box. Only one eighth is inside the box. But the gold one, the whole atom is in the box. So I have 8 eighths and 1 gold atom. So 8 eighths is 1 plus the 1 that's sitting right in the middle equals 2. So in a body-centered cubic, there are on average 2 atoms per cell. Now let's look at the coordination number. This atom is directly next to 8 other atoms. Which atoms is this one touching? Well, it's we can see right here that it's not directly touching the purple ones, right? These, pur or rather, the purple ones are not directly touching each other, I should say. The purple ones, there's a little gap in between. But the purple ones are all touching the gold one. So when I'm trying to determine the coordination number, which is how many atoms are directly touching each atom, then I would look at this one and say, well, it's not touching any of the other purple ones because there's a little tiny gap in between the purple ones, but there's no gap in between the purple and the, and the gold. So, it's, so this one is touching one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight atoms. So that applies to every atom. This one is right next to eight atoms. This one is right next to eight atoms. This one is right next to eight atoms. This one is right next to eight atoms, and so on and so on throughout the whole structure. So the coordination number of this structure is 8. Let's look at this one again. How do I know that the coordination number of this one is 6? Well, which one, how many is this one directly touching? Well, it touches one above, one below, one to the left, one to the right, one in front, and one behind. So every atom in a simple cubic is touching six other atoms. Every atom in a body-centered cubic is touching eight other atoms. And every atom in a face-centered cubic is touching 12 other atoms. So which 12 is it touching? Well, if we look at each structure, at each uh, layer here, the gold one is directly touching these purple ones. But the purple ones do not touch each other. All of the gold ones are touching each other. All the gold ones throughout the middle are touching each other. But all the purple ones are not. There's a space in between the purple ones. So I have to look at this purple one, that, which I know is touching the gold ones, right? If I say this one right here in the middle is this one, then this one is touching all the gold ones and none of the purple ones. 
So let's count all the gold ones. If I'm looking at this one, I have one, two, three, four, that this purple one is touching in this lattice plane. I have one, two, three, four, that this one is touching in this lattice plane down here. And one, two, three, four, these two right here are not part of it. These two right here are not touching this one because they're on the other sides of this cube, right? So in this plane, I have one, two, three, four. These are the four that are directly next to this one. So I have four down here, four in this plane, and then four in this plane. Four, eight, twelve that are touching. Every atom is touching 12 other atoms. Um, how many atoms are in a unit cell? Well, I still have the eight eighths because I'm always talking about these purple ones being at the corner and they always get sliced into eighths. So I have eight eighths, that's one atom. I don't have one in the middle anymore. So I don't have an atom that does not get sliced. Every atom gets sliced in this one. And if I look at an atom that's sitting on the face of a cube, how much of it is inside the cube and how much of it is outside the cube? Oops, if its center point is directly on this face, then half of it is inside the cube and half of it is outside the cube. So for every face, for every atom that sits on the face of a cube, there is half of that atom. Half of it is inside the box, half of it is outside the box. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six atoms that sit on faces. One half of those atoms, one half at six faces equals three. So one eighth times eight, there's one atom because of the purple ones. And then one half times six is three. So there's four total atoms inside of a face-centered cubic unit cell. So um, with spheres, it is more efficient to offset each row in the gaps of the previous row than to line up the rows and columns. So um, this is where we get to uh, some of those unit cells that were not represented before um, in the cubic. When we were looking at cubic, they're all right next to each other, so the angles are all 90. But if we look at this structure here, that is, these angles are not 90, right? So this is not a cubic unit cell. But it's more efficient for the spheres to pack this way. They're going to have a higher packing efficiency. So the second layer of atoms can sit directly over the atoms in the first layer, and we call that the AA pattern. Or the second layer of atoms can sit over the holes in the first ladder, in the first pattern, and we call that the AB pattern. So if they are right on top of each other, then the angles between those atoms is go are going to be 90 degrees. If they sit, if the layer B sits in the holes of layer A, then none of these angles are going to be 90 degrees. We'll have uh, uh, we'll have these lengths will all look like they're all equal, but none of the angles are 90 degrees. So we'll either have um, this one, rhombohedral, all of the sides are the same and I have no 90 degree angles. Um, or we can have a hexagonal where two of the sides are the same and two of the faces are 90 but one of the faces is 120. But in any case, we this is not tetragonal because some of those angles are not 90. So it can't be cubic or tetragonal or, or orthorhombic if we have this arrangement of spheres. We're looking at one of these other patterns in that case. So here's um, an example of hexagonal closest packing. So in hexagonal, one of these angles is 120. So I can see that this angle between this atom, this atom, and this atom this makes an angle that is 120 degrees. And between these atoms, 
here's a right angle, that's 90, and here is a right angle, that's 90. And um, because all of these atoms are the same atoms, then uh, they're going to push, when I, when I put the atoms, when I offset the layers like this, then there's going to be some gap in between the corners. They can't touch because these red atoms are in the middle. So that means that some of these lengths are going to be different sides, right? So this length does not equal this length. They're different lengths. So this is the kind of information that we get from an x-ray analysis, and we can use that information to place the unit cell uh, to represent the unit cell in one of these seven different types. So de to determine the coordination number in a hexagonal closest packing arrangement, we would focus on an atom and try to see how many atoms are directly touching it. So if we look at this atom right here in the middle, I can see that all of the atoms that are in this plane are touching each other. But this plane, the blue plane of atoms here, does not touch the blue plane of atoms below. So this plane of atoms, the blue ones here, they all touch each other, and they're all touching the red ones directly below them, and the red ones that would be directly above them. But the blue planes do not touch each other. So I would focus on one atom and try to see how many atoms are directly next to this one. Well, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six that are in that lattice plane that are the blue atoms lie in. And there are one, two, three red ones below. Three red ones below that are touching this blue one in the middle, right? One, two, three. And then I'd have three red ones above that would also be touching this blue one in the middle. So altogether we have 12, a coordination number of 12. So similar to our face-centered cubic structure. Although a hexagonal closest packing and a face-centered cubic are not the same unit cell, they're different because all of these angles are not 90. I have angles of 60 and 120, so that makes these um, atoms, this unit cell, is different than a cubic unit cell. This is called a cubic closest packed. That's the face-centered cubic. So again, it's, it's the coordination number is the same. Hexagonal closest packing and cubic closest packing. They try to get as close to each other as they possibly can. And sometimes that leads to all 90 degree angles. And uh, A equals B equals C, the lengths of the cubic cell. And sometimes uh, because of the way that those layers get um, offset, then that leads to A does not equal B, these lengths are different, and the angles are not all 90. These angles between this atom and this atom are not 90 degrees here. 